Uh, Akwe, uh, that's peace in my language. Uh, my name is Po Wapi Niampog, and I am the Superior Chief of Fauna, which is the Federation of Aboriginal Nations of America, and one, I am one of the original chartered members. Uh, Akwe, Niampog, that is peace be unto you, friends. Nisu Wishawinog was translated from Nahigansid into English as Two Hawks. I am Director General for the Federation and uh, Pumiham Sachem of the Meshipag Nahigansid tribe, which is also one of the chartering members of the Federation. Chief Nikat Amatsukwaf. I am the Chief Development Officer for FANA and also Chief of the Amatsukwaf Kitsukiai. I'm Ronnie Deer and I'm on the Royal Council of Seven for the Poconokit tribe, Poconokit Nation. So, in respect to uh, what is FANA, I think it would make sense to give a kind of crash course in terms of what is FANA and what it does mm -hmm. to then understand um, anything else coming from FANA. So whoever would like to take that? Mm -hmm. uh, so what FANA is, it's a tribally trust chartered institution, which is a confederation of American Aboriginal tribes and nations that have been able to document their existence prior to U.S. colonization on their soils. Uh, FANA consists of about 7,000 tribal members up and down the East Coast and into Puerto Rico. And uh, the chartering members, of course, are the Poconokit Nation, of which the Sagamore and the Superior Chief here is the chief of that nation, the Meshipag Nayagansa tribe, and the Sandhill Band of Lenape and Cherokee Indians out of New York, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Uh, FANA was trust chartered so that tribal nations who are operating in the capacity that we all are, which is through tribal trust charter established according to international Hague trust treaty standards, could come together to work to develop policies, procedures, and then implement them that would be beneficial for our people. Uh, one of the main issues is that most times the only way that nations are able to gain any sort of recognition or acknowledgement is through a federal recognition process. But in the process of doing that, to simplify it all, what happens is the federal government creates a tribal trust and then inserts the U.S. Congress as the caretakers of the trust. So that's why you often hear of federal trust lands. FANA has elected to not go that route because we don't feel that given our heritage and our bloodlines, we should be in any sort of recognition with any colonial entity. We were here before the U.S. got here. Why would we put ourselves into a position of subjugation underneath them now? Simultaneously, FANA has not rescinded any sort of U.S. citizenship, but rather reclassified ourselves to our proper status as American Aborigine. And an Aborigine, if you look at the legal definition, is of the original people. A lot of people looking at it just with normal terminology would think that it means not normal. But of course, we know legal terminology and common language terminology are often uh, conflicting. So when you look at the legal terminology, Aborigine means of the original people. So we are American Aborigine of the original people of these lands called America. Um, from that point forward, we've been moving in a manner that creates institutions for ourselves according to not only United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, but also the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which was passed June 16, 2016 by the Organization of American States which is binding upon the United States of America and also makes indigenous issues human rights issues. And that's really what this is all about, making sure that we're operating in our proper capacity, making sure that we are negotiating and working with local law enforcement agencies to inform them of who we are and who our people are, and also creating a better future for our tribal members and citizens because the federal recognition process has excluded most of us from that and we don't feel like we should have to be proving ourselves to a colonial entity when we were here first and our bloodlines speak for themselves. How does that sound, Chief? I think you've done an excellent job uh, explaining who Father is. So um, in, in that same um, line of, of questions, in order to better understand, you know, the, the kind of the environment that uh, Fana is operating in and also what's going on in, 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 in politics and in um, social issues in the country. There's another organization called uh, NAAIP, and I'd like to, to kind of refer to that because I noticed that on social media there's been a lot of association mm -hmm. uh, and indirect association, and I think it needs to uh, be addressed. 
So, um, uh, who or what is NAIP and how did uh, Fana ever have any um, connection or dealings with them? Because that's a question that's on the people's minds. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, so the NAIP is the National Association for the Advancement of Indigenous People. It's an institution that was started by an individual by the name of Hemak Shilop. Originally, I found out about NAIP in 2014. Uh, via Facebook, you know, very active on Facebook, and saw this gentleman talking about issues of misclassification for dark-skinned Aborigine. As we looked more into his background and what he was talking about, the legal edicts and, and, and uh, principles that he was talking about definitely met up to research standards. He was speaking specifically about the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, and how it had misclassified a lot of Indians to the uh, classification of colored. And this resonated with me in particular because my fourth great grandfather, Chief Brister Michael of the Narragansett Indian tribe, was chief of the tribe in 1881 when the state of Rhode Island illegally detribalized them. And my grandmother, rest in peace, before she passed, had done a lot of research on our historical lineage. And she was able to come across a copy of his death certificate, and lo and behold, on the death certificate, he was listed as colored. So if they can do that to the chief of a tribe who's documented by the state in the 1881 commission's report on an Indian affairs, they can do that to any tribal member. So when he was speaking of these things, he was also speaking of the United Nations Declaration, on the right to self-determination, all of these elements were adding up. So I ended up reaching out to the gentleman on uh, Facebook and I said to him, hey look, don't know too much about you, don't know too much about your institution, but you're saying that you can help this is who my people are, and of course, once again, pre-colonial, if I could share the uh, Sagamore and the Superior Chief's lineage, he is the 10th generation grandson of the Massasoit Osamequin. Massasoit means great leader, Osamequin means yellow feather of the Poconoke tribe of the Poconoke nation. You would know the Massasoit from being the chief that greeted the pilgrims and saved them, being the chief that had the first Thanksgiving with the pilgrims, being the chief that ultimately signed the first treaty with the English. And then also, he's the ninth generation great-grandson of Poe Medicom, who's more commonly referred to as King Philip, who was the chief that started the King Philip's War. And then he's also the sixth generation great-grandson of Simeon Simons, who was George Washington's hand-picked bodyguard during the Revolutionary War. So this is the lineage that we're dealing with. The chief here is direct lineage from the Powhatan uh, uh, royal line. Would you care to share a little bit about your heritage, chief? Uh, originally, uh, traditional land is Kiskak, which is the Yorktown area of Virginia. Um, actually, our traditional lands is currently the Yorktown Naval Base. Mm. Um, our families, when at, at a point where they kind of wiped out or attempted to wipe out the tribes, were dispersed among all bordering um, villages. The, the Chickahominy, the Eastern Chickahominy, the Rappahannocks, the Pumankees, which my line actually goes to the chief line of all of those tribes. And what is the particular names of some of the chiefs that you connect to, Chief? Uh, they're all the, the last name of Bragby, mm -hmm. um, William T. Bragby, um, Terrell Bragby, um, uh, uh, Alan Bragby, and also um, Alexander Bragby. Mm -hmm. So once again, when you're talking about Fani, you're talking about tribes and nations that there's no question of who we are and no question of, of the substantiation of, of our heritage. So I reached out to him and I explained this to him and he was very eager to come and help. We talked about the fact that NAAIP just simply helps people to reclassify to their proper status and then to pursue legal remedy for the things that had been done to them in terms of the misclassification. And this was of interest to me so I invited the gentleman up to our territories to come and meet with some of the other tribes that were up here. Eventually, he did make his way up here, I think, two trips he made before I introduced him to the actual chiefs. He did a presentation to the chiefs, and once again, his legal sort of doctrine was right on point with what we had known, and there seemed to be an actual option for us moving forward. So a number of us decided to become NAAIP members so that we would then have, in his opinion, the ability to access his database of resources and be able to engage with him as a consultant as we move these things forward. And that's what we did. Now, this is going into 2015 at this time. At this time, he also invited the superior chief and I to attend the United Nations with him, uh, which was interesting for us because we had never been to the United Nations. 
And upon going to the United Nations, we were actually able to enter the United Nations with the NAAIP card. So, of course, this is substantiating in our eyes more of what he's saying. So we came back from there and started to speak to more of our people. A number of them were very hesitant to get involved with the institution, so they didn't. Uh, but the individuals who were involved continued to build upon the information that he had shared and also do research amongst ourselves. Eventually, um, and this is where we kind of red flags started to go up. He uh, now, can I interject? That's is sure. that about a year? How long? Yes, this is about it. This is taking place over about a year's time. Now, okay. in this time, I would like to also mention that he had gone back down to his place in Cherokee, North Carolina, or somewhere around there. And one day I just got a phone call from him and the man was hysterical on the phone talking about the cops had taken his children and he needed to get them back and this, that and the other. Uh, so, you know, the brother had come up and shared some very good information. So us, you know, as Indian folk are, we were wanting to help. Um, so he ended up coming up here with a number of his children. For a while, we actually putting him up in spaces to stay because he didn't have any money. And during this time, we, uh, he was holding classes at a local community center, just educating our people around the issues of misclassification, um, reclassification, mm -hmm. status and standing, uh, international law, all things that are very, very solid in terms of the law and how they can be applied and should be understood. Um, at this point, he made a suggestion to me, FANA. And I said, well, what is FANA? He said, well, FANA is the Federation of Aborigine Nations of America. And it's very important to understand that language he used, Federation of Aborigine Nations of America, because we are the Federation of Aboriginal Nations of America. And he said that, you know, NAAIP is just for individuals, so it doesn't really have power. All it can really do is kind of help people to find out who they are. But us, with our history, was so substantial that we really should be moving in a capacity that was beyond NAAIP. And that as our consultant, he was suggesting that we not only establish fauna, but that we also reach out to the Sand Hill Band of Lenape and Cherokee Indians. So the Sagamore and I, through our research, we found out who Sand Hill was. Of course, they were pre-colonial just like we were. He facilitated some conversation between the Sagamore and Chief Yanaguska and Taliona. Uh, well-respected chiefs from Sand Hill who had been in attendance at the United Nations for a number of years. We had ongoing dialogue and we actually collectively created a charter mm -hmm. that the three nations came together to form to create fauna. Now, during this time period, it just kept bothering me. Uh, I was be getting ready to be an adjunct professor at, um, at Roger Williams University and the grammar thing was just on my mind. And Federation of Aborigine Nations of America just didn't seem grammatically correct. And, you know, Creator works in very strange ways, but it, I, it just wouldn't leave me alone. So I said to the rest of the chiefs, you know, I really think it should be Federation of Aboriginal Nations of America. It just seems to be more grammatically correct. And the chiefs agreed with me. So instead of chartering the Federation of Aborigine Nations of America, we chartered the Federation of Aboriginal Nations of America. And that'll... that'll uh, put itself out as I discuss a little bit further. We chartered that January of 2016? January of 2016 we chartered that. The chiefs came up from uh, Sand Hill Band of Lenape and Cherokee Indians. We first met at the uh, Sagamore's house, the Superior Chief's house, and then we went over to the community center where we held the chartering ceremony, signed and sealed the document, and FANA was established. Now at this time uh, let me reverse a little bit. The reason we engaged with Hemak initially was because he told us he was coming from a tribe called the Chachiyuma tribe out of the Tennessee area. And when we did our background check, there was indeed a historical Chachiyuma tribe. And his argument was that they had been uh, classified as being extinct. But in fact, they were a real tribe and he was a descendant of it. And he, you know, he had gotten to a certain point in terms of his lineage, but he was certain that he was a Chachiyuma member. And, you know, because of the information that he was supplying, we, we at the time had no reason to question that, particularly because of our experience here. So that's why we began to engage with him. So at this time, as we created FANA, he was still Director General or National Director or whatever his position was with NAAIP. He said that he would like to take on a consulting role with FANA and would like to be our Executive Attaché. And as Executive Attaché, he would help us with developing other protocols and procedures, to assist the tribes in doing what they're doing because it was also beneficial to NAAIP 
to be working with tribes of our of our that could substantiate themselves the way that we could. Um, and he was doing that for a while. You might see on his NAAIP America Facebook page some video and some pictures up from an International Indigenous Peoples Cultural Conference that we held in 2016, March of 2016, March of April, uh, where he was involved in that conference. But it was also FANA who was one of the sponsors as well as an organization that I was able to start the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative. Uh, NAAIP was one of the sponsors, but it most certainly wasn't the main sponsor. He did help us in getting some individuals to be able to come and speak at the conference. So if you look at his page, what you will see is pictures of us, but all from 2016. Uh, after the conference came, it then became time to register for visits to the United Nations. And being that FANA was now a separate institution from NAAIP, our interest was to register and to go as FANA. Being executive attache, he put out to the group that he would be the one to assist me in registration for the United Nations visit. And so for about a seven to eight week period, I asked him at least once a week when we were going to register for the UN and he made it out to be this very detailed and involved process that you didn't want to get wrong and we needed to just hold up because there was a couple of other things that were important but that we would get to the registration. So this went on and eventually I remember asking him twice in one week saying, hey, you know, it's getting very close to the UN. We don't want to miss the registration deadline. What's going on? So finally, one day he said, okay, let's go ahead and register. And of course, I went to register and lo and behold, the registration deadline had passed. So I'm saying to myself, well, this is craziness. I've been asking this man for seven, eight weeks now to register and all of a sudden the deadline's passed and he's saying that he didn't know that the deadline was coming up. Um, so, in conversation, he then suggested that NAAIP create an agreement with FANA that FANA would go in underneath them and they would represent FANA at the UN, to which I immediately replied, no, I couldn't do that. I said, a lot of my people were very wary about the NAAIP institution. They allowed us to move forward as a tribe with the other tribes because it was a separate institution from NAAIP. And that if I went back and tried to pitch this to my people, they would remove me from chief. I said, so I wasn't going to do that. I didn't think it was in my own personal interest to do that. And I didn't think any of the other tribes, or in particular my tribal members, would go for that. <coughs> and his response to me at that point was, well, I guess you got some figuring out to do. So right there, I started to look at him differently. Now, to the credit of Nikad here, Nikad had been raising red flags for a while. Just about certain things that Hemok was saying. Uh, at one point, he had had a conversation with Hemok about some information that he found, and then when we had our FANA meeting, which we were doing on a weekly basis, Hemok presented that information as if he found it. So I was having these conversations with Nikon <laughs> at the time, but I was still willing to give him the benefit of the doubt up until the point where um, this situation happened with FANA. Now, in the meantime, the Sagamore just pointed out, we had engaged with the Rhode Island Department of Health, uh, been talking to them about reclassification, about how they were missing our population in the state. We had gone around and met with uh, representatives from the state police. Uh, prior to that, we had met with representatives from the governor's office and the attorney general's office. So we were going around doing our due diligence of letting everyone know who we were. And of course, all of these state institutions knowing us, not only from our work as Aboriginal nations, but just from being good community members and active in the community, you know, they were fully understanding and respecting the, the process and the manner that we were moving in. And this is where I guess he started to see the potential and started to get a little greedy. So we ended up deciding um, that, you know what, since certain of us were indeed NAAIP members, uh, we would go as individual NAAIP members and use our NAAIP cards to gain access. But that once we got there, we would be presenting ourselves as representatives of FANA. And in conversation with Sand Hill, Band of Lenape, and Cherokee Indians, they said that that was a common practice at the UN, that organizations that weren't able to get in would often go under other organizations and then be able to speak on behalf of their organization when they got there. And of course, Sand Hill had been going there for years. So we collectively decided that that's how we would move, but it was understood that we were going as FANA representatives. We created our own UN statement which we read it, well, we didn't get a chance to read, but we submitted it to the UN and we also posted it on the internet for people to view. You can check that out. Um, if you go to our FANA script page, you can see what our UN declaration was. Ultimately, we didn't get the chance, we weren't allowed the opportunity to speak there,
But I come to find out after that the, one of the reasons we didn't get the chance is because the UN told uh, HEMOC that, well, only one organization could speak at the UN since we came under NAAIP. And he went and told them, well, that it would be NAAIP. So it was NAAIP. Uh, this was never conveyed to me at the time, but it ended up being NAAIP. He ended up going back a few weeks later with the Sagamore. Uh, stating that he was going to support Fana's opportunity to speak there. Some of you may have seen that on the internet as well, where he's speaking, talking about the treaty with the English as rescinded and all of that sort of stuff. And this is all during our time, uh, once again, leading up to and going to the UN. Now, while at the UN, come to find out that he had told other chiefs that I was going to be paying for their accommodations there. He had also spread a rumor I had gotten a fellowship from the Rhode Island Foundation to do cultural work with the Providence Cultural Equity Initiative that I was supposed to give him $30,000 of my fellowship for him to do the work that he was doing, when in actuality I told him, I'll give you $3,000 to serve as a consultant for the year, and then hopefully as things continue, there'll be some more dollars, but given my budget, that's what I can afford. And that conversation was had right in front of NECOT. Right. So he had begun after the situation where I said that no fauna wouldn't go under NAAIP or sign that agreement with him, to try to discredit me amongst the other chiefs that were involved with FANA. Uh, fortunately, the chiefs are, are chiefs of integrity and they know of the good work that I have been doing, so they weren't feeding into it and were making me aware of these things. So, at, at, at kind of when, you know, going over everything that we've said up to this point, mm -hmm. it, it, I'm understanding that up to the point after the UN visit, there was a change in, in, in the way that uh, the gentleman was conducting himself in yes. reference to the group. And um, when it came down to some of these big disagreements, it came down to uh, 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 some money. Money. Um, or the, uh, the potential of money. But, yes. And how folks are reacting to that coming into play to whether somebody's going to get some money from you or from someone else. It's all just about money. About money. And, and if you've had any experience with HEMOC, if you talk to people that have had experience with him, He's all about the money. He uses the Lord, he uses people's ignorance, and plays on it to try to dupe them out of fundings. I heard, and I won't give any names, but he duped a certain family out of $40,000. Um, you know, he, 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 it's just craziness. But just to get back a little bit, because I want to finish this particular story so you can understand exactly what Fonda's current stance is in relationship is with NAAIP. Because this has been a very hot topic on Facebook in particular. For the past week, I've actually been battling with a number of individuals who are concerned with the fact that we might be Washitar and Moors and things of that nature. And I'll tell you, I had never heard the terminology until Sand Hill informed us when we started to have issues with HEMA that he had had involvement with Moors. So now we come back from the United Nations. Uh, we have our first FANA meeting. I remember getting there a little bit late. Once again, it was at the community center. And I remember walking in and sitting down. And this man, I just remember him yelling just yelling about what an awful trip the UN had been and how we had really messed things up and we had presented ourselves as fools and all of this. And this was just staggering to me because from Farmer's perspective, the UN had been a fantastic visit. Uh, we had met indigenous leaders from all around the world. We had been able to inform them of who we were. We were able to hand out our UN statements so people would understand the heritage of the tribes that were involved. We got to take some fantastic pictures which legitimized a lot of the work we were doing. And once again, we had gone there without being required to use U United States forms of identification. So for us, this was a tremendous visit. But he was adamant that it was an awful visit. So I was just sitting, listening, watching kind of the body language of the people around the room. And at one point, the words actually came out his mouth that he needed to be our big war chief and that he needed to be able to make policy for the next five years for Fauna unquestioned that we had removed him from his opportunity to be a chartering member of the Federation, which was never part of the discussion, because you don't even know what your heritage is that well, Hemok. You just, you just say you're from Chachayuma. Mm. And we respected that, but to think that you would be on the level with pre-colonial chiefs whose heritage is documented, that's just foolishness. On top of that, the man did not know his culture whatsoever. He just knew the law. We, were edu we had to educate him what the difference between a clan, a tribe, and a nation was. Um, if you see his pictures, he's constantly wearing like the, uh, uh, a beanie, and then he would stick feathers in it. And, you know, I mean, to each his own, but that's certainly not 
anything that we would sub subscribe to or promote, but you know, okay, he mop. And now uh, is coming into play this information about him potentially being a Moor. So of course, once once I heard that, I had to speak up at the time, and I said, "Well, that's insane." I said, "We're not. You're not going to be our big war chief. We got the the, the Sagamore right here. He's he's the chief up here. I mean, you've got Yanaguska and Taliona. So why would we choose to make you the big war chief?" I said, "On top of that, you know, there was issues with uh, signing up for the for the UN, which you, you were supposed to do." And at this point, he literally tried to put it on me as being the one who dropped the ball for the UN registration. So right there, I said, okay, everything Nikot was saying was true. All of the other issues that people were bringing up were now true, and I'm starting to see the true colors of this man. So a few of us began to push back at him, and true to his nature, he just decided, I'm done with this conversation, and got up and left. He said, if anyone wants to engage with me any further, I'll be at my house. So some people left, most of us stayed. And at that point, we started to say, okay, this man's out of control. Uh, not quite sure what's going on with him, but something's definitely not right. And uh, we, need to, we need to figure out how we're going to move forward. And he, don't forget the fact that at the meeting, he also stated that he was going to shut down our trust. Yes, he was going to shut down our tribal trust. And that's the most disingenuous thing about this individual. You came here presenting yourselves as an individual who wanted to help pre-colonial nations to be able to get right with the law, protect their lands, be sovereign and be able to move forward how they're supposed to move forward. And in the end, you're lying, saying that you have control of our trust and you can shut them down if you want to. The Sagamore, um, at his request, I met with Hemok at his house, in which once again, he threatened to shut the trust down, in which I replied to him, well, go ahead and do it then, if you feel you can do it. But if you think that I'm gonna walk around here in front of my people, like a coward, telling them that we have to submit to some fool out of Tennessee who doesn't even know his own culture, you got me mistaken for someone else. I don't know who you have me mistaken for, and I don't see any of the other founding member nations doing that either. That was the last time I had any direct conversation with Hemok Shilip. This was around May or June of 2016. Maybe June of 2016. And to, to understand, a, a lot of folks may have, under, may have heard of NAAIP or heard of some of uh, their dealings associated with um, uh, the the events in North Dakota yeah. and all these events because of, of some traveling. After those those disagreements, I think that he went traveling all when over I, the well, country. Well, he had to get up out of our territory. Yeah, so if, if, if you can kind of well, touch sure, on that I mean, to where we are today. Sure. So after that, we had a breakup. He actually sent us over an email or something telling us that we couldn't use information that he had made public. Just a bunch of foolishness. So we responded via letter approved by the chiefs of Fauna, basically telling him that um, he didn't have any right to tell us that, that our trusts were not tied into anything that he personally owned or operated. We had created our own trust, so therefore we weren't under any jurisdiction with him. That we, He said that we had violated NAAIP member um, policy, so we asked him to see the specific member policies that we had violated. He told us that he was rescinding the contracts because at this time he had assisted us in developing tort claims against the uh, state in the cities for environmental denigration under just cogents. Uh, we, of course, allowed him to rescind those contracts with us because the tort claims weren't on point correctly anyway. There was certain language that was allowed to be in there that forced uh, certain claims to be kicked out and have to be refiled. So we, we rescinded those. And then we told him from this point forward, do not associate yourself with fauna or anything that we're doing. This was in July of 2016, this letter was sent over to him. That's when he got on the road. Um, and that's when he started going other places, swindling other people because he knew it wasn't a comfortable place for him in Rhode Island anymore. He ended up out at Standing Rock, looked like a complete buffoon. He uh, disparaged a woman by the name of Yonaz the Lone Wolf, calling her a COINTELPRO operative. When the tribal council at Standing Rock did not want to listen to what he had to say, he went on Facebook Live and said that they were COINTEL operatives. Then he ended up in Los Angeles or something like that. Now, during this time period, there was another gentleman who was an associate of his by the name of Sikanu, who came up and visited us at the Sagamore's house. Um, and I guess Hemak had not told him the full story of what had happened because he came in trying to explain... Uh, what a benefit he could be and how we didn't need to work with Hemok, we could work with him directly. And he kind of messed himself up when he said, you know, well, we were the ones who, you know, uh, worked out the Constitution and signed a treaty with the U.S., to which I responded, well, hold on one second. 
Because our people were here before any U.S. Constitution or treaty was signed. As a matter of fact, when that Constitution or treaty was getting signed, our people were being enslaved and, and removed from their lands. So we don't recognize or respect that. We're before that. And we, would, we wouldn't have any interest in building around anything like that. And that's when he kind of realized that, you know, he wasn't going to get very far with us. Uh, we then explained to him the information that we had and the capacity that we were moving in. And as we started to explain all of these things, you could kind of see on his face, it was kind of even, it was almost like a he mock you idiot sort of, of thing. <laughs> because what are you going to say to us? There's really nothing that could be offered to us that would be beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. We're already doing everything we need to do. And we're doing it collectively. Mm -hmm. At that time, there were about seven or eight uh, Fond Amendment nations. So right. what do we need mm -hmm. one particular individual for when we're collectively moving together and doing this research? So that gentleman went on his way, and he actually ended up having a falling out with Hemok. So now he's fighting with his own people. There's internal strife going on, and at this time, we're still hands off from everything going on with NAAIP. Yeah, so things have been very quiet. Um, we have actually continued to develop processes, develop institutions. Uh, we've been working with the tribes to create commerce departments. Uh, continued meeting with uh, state institutions. We're actually able to access health care for our people by federal policy. Uh, working directly, we actually had a meeting with the health department's chief uh, legal, whatever their title is. I uh, was able to show her not only the validity of our trust based upon our blood heritage and our people, but also how the federal policy applied to urban Indians which is, you know, terminology, if you look at the federal policy, the first, if it's a 30-page document, the first 28 pages will be about Native Americans and federal recognition, and the last two will be about American Indians and urban Indians. But if you only read the first 28, which is what they want you to, you'll never get to that information, and sometimes they'll even throw it in the middle. So we have been moving forward tremendously because the state knows who we are, the state knows about bloodline heritages, they know what they did to us in terms of risk, misclassification, and they realize now that we've been able to figure the situation out, and by law they have to work with us. So, um, Chief, uh, and and in the interest of, of differentiating um, NAAIP, FANA, and sometimes with dilution people start using these terms because they know something is happening and certain folks are doing it. It's coming from a certain area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I understand that some credit has been attempted yeah. to been well usurped and taken yeah. about uh, this Medicom camp yeah. and its founding and who's working it. I think that uh, in no uncertain terms you should address that so that it's clear who's uh, sure. who's uh, taking point on this situation uh, sure. with the Pope Medicom camp and, and who's involved and who isn't. Absolutely. So let me be very clear and say in no uncertain terms, NAAIP has no association with FANA. They created their fake FANA institution. They created a fake logo that tried to copy ours but was terrible. And we have nothing to do with them. What this fool has been doing since he has lost his credibility amongst Indian country he has been resharing things that he's finding on the internet off of his NAAIP America page, presenting it as if he's still involved. And how do you know this? Well, he said on the page that there were tort claims being getting ready to be filed against Brown University within the next week. Not the case at all. The, the, the Superior Chief, the Sagamore of the Poconoke Nation, and this is a Poconoke Nation camp here, Po Medicom is King Philip. So this is the Poconoke Nation camp here. Fonda has been providing assistance along with the Fan Collective because the Poconoke Nation are the rightful stewards of this land. It is historically documented. It is by bloodline ties documented. There is no question as to who the Poconokes are and what their ties to this land are. Those are the institutions that have been involved in supporting the Poconoke in this repatriation of these lands given the fact that we've been trying to engage with the state for the past two years since 2015. Because he has ruined his credibility, he's been resharing these things, presenting them as, oh, NAAIP members, because remember, once again, certain members of us did join NAAIP, myself included. He posted a picture of my template card that he processed for me, but did not put that the template card was issued in October 1st of 2014. 2014. So instead he presents the card as if we're still actively involved today. 
He's got footage up of the Chiefs speaking, the Sagamore speaking at the 2016 conference that we did at Roger Williams. But if you notice, why doesn't he have any footage up from 2017? Because we did a conference in 2017, he just wasn't allowed to come to it. He has no pictures up from any visit to the UN in 2017, although he was putting out through his page that he was getting ready for the visit. Why? Because the UN is on to him. And they actually changed the guidelines for attending the UN permanent forum. They said you had to be a previous, a, a certified indigenous people's organization. A certified indigenous people's, which he is not. He just registered as one. We were able to attend the UN this year at the invitation of our good friend and brother, UN Ambassador Wampatuck Wampamequin, who's been doing his best to explain to everyone that no, Fauna has no relationship with NAAIP and neither should you. And we back the ambassador up in that assertion because this man is a clown. In our opinion, what he's been trying to do, and I've actually also recently had the opportunity to have some convers very good conversation with uh, Chief Elwin Warhorse Gillum of the um, Chata Nation out of Louisiana, because he was also down in that area having individuals who were trying to find out who they were, charter Chata Nation tribes. Different bands and tribes of the Chata Nation, but never informing her that this is what he was doing in her territory. So I had the opportunity to speak on a conference called Her People and inform them what our experience had been with Hemok Shilap and how we had booted him. And once again, 85% of what he says is truthful by law, it's that other 15%. So he's been resharing. And like I said, for the past week, I've just been having to go very hard at people on I Love Ancestry. And shout out to our good friend, uh, Adrian Hextel, who's been following me personally for about the past seven years on the work I've been doing in my own community. So Katapatish Adrian, thank you very much for supporting us uh, because Adrian has been an adamant supporter of the fact that we are who we say we are. So I've been having communication with Adrian as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but on his post, these individuals are coming on and attacking. And I'm posting historical documentation. I'm posting pictures of me with my family members. I'm pic posting pictures of my family members, and it's still not getting through. Well, lo and behold, when I go and look on his page, it's because he posted that picture of me up there. And I said yesterday on the post, you know what? I understand where y'all are coming from, because if that was me, I would have thought the same thing. So I went on there livid yesterday. I tagged Nikod, I tagged a few of the other chiefs on there. I tagged Chief Talionum from Sand Hill. Just livid. I was like, you're a liar. You're a hypocrite. We, find out, we found out when you came up to Rhode Island, it wasn't because the police were chasing you. It was because you beat your wife and ran up there. I mean, this is the type of man that this individual is. He's a liar and a con artist. He has no integrity, and we don't respect him, and we don't honor him. And because he has nothing else to do but repost stuff that's going on, and because he can claim that he had a relationship with us, he's just been reposting this stuff on his page, trying to legitimize what he's already lost. We have absolutely no connection with NAAIPI, with NAAIP. NAAIPI was the institution he created after he lost control of us with NAAIP. He then created this new institution. He supposedly had a commerce claim in. And now he was saying that the only way you could be a part of the original commerce claim was to now join NAAIPI, to which we told him we had no interest. Take us out of the claim if that's what the situation is. Um, he then created an NAAIP media. All of this foolishness going on, he's creating all of these institutions to dupe people into thinking that he's some sort of expert or has the answer to what their issues are. And to me, it's very, very, very disingenuous because he's preying upon people who are trying to find out who they are. We have no association with any Moorish groups. I want to be very clear with that right now. Fauna is people from these lands. We're not from Northwest Amexum. We're not Moroccan. We're not Moabite. We're not any of that. We did not refer to this land as Al Morocco. We did not put ourselves underneath any king from Morocco. While they're claiming that this land is Al Morocco, the Massasoit's here. My grandfather Canonicus is here. Powhatan's here. So how can you claim that all of this land is Al Morocco when these chiefs are here and chiefs of their own nation until you can prove that these chiefs gave homage or were subjected to Morocco? That entire claim is false. So, so yes. So in the interest of time, because we, we're, we're at about 39 minutes sure. so far, right. and this is a very robust topic, um, I, I, I think that uh, it's very clear, and, and it should be clear to the uh, viewer and the listener, 
that fe the Federation of Aboriginal Nations of America has no association with NAAIP, NAAIPI, or any of its latter manifestations, and um, that it's not because of, of a lack in communication, it's because of some blatant lies mm -hmm. and events that happened mm -hmm. to where we are here today um, at the Poe Medicom camp and making these moves that this man or this institution has nothing to do with mm -hmm. and is trying to uh, usurp and hijack. And understand, he's a fraud. He's a fraud. His whole, even when he was here, he spent a lot of time t trying to explain to us what he could do and why we had to be NAIP members to be able to say who we are. Mm -hmm. And this is the same lie that he's told to anyone. Give me $75 mm -hmm. and you become a member and then you can say who you are, mm -hmm. you know? And you'll have access to database that we've never received access mm -hmm. to, access to information that he never provided because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. He's a fraud. Great, so I think, um, I think uh, this is a good introduction Mm. to uh, what's happening here at Poe Medicom Camp. And mm. we're also going to uh, continue to bring it to you on the Poe Medicom Chronicles. And we'd like to thank uh, all of the FANA members who are on this, the, uh, the, the screen here telling you and educating you about that. And if we can just um, kind of piece it out, tell everyone who it is, where can they come to find out more information about the camp if sure. they want to help because um, that's what the, this is about. Sure. And um, yeah, let me go from so, there. PoeMedicomCamp.org, uh, fantastic friends from Fang. Um, they've been very supportive of the Poconoke Nation, uh, assisting in helping to organize a fantastic uh, march against, uh, well, not against, but at Brown University yesterday, uh, which is some interesting, very interesting stuff going on there. Um, you can go there if you're looking to come here to support the camp. You can go there and fill out the form to be able to actually come here. PoeMedicomCamp.org. .org, yes. And we just want to say to everyone out there, look, you don't even have to take our word for it. Check the historicity of what we're saying. You don't have to take, don't take my word for it. I don't, we don't look like stereotypical Native Americans. And that's the whole point of what we're doing here. There's been a lot of lies that have been told about Aboriginal folks in general, about how they're supposed to look, about where they were at, about who they are. And that's why, in our opinion, this camp is so important because it's uncovering a lot of those things. And to be quite honest, I'm even looking at this hemoc Shelop situation as a benefit because we're getting the chance to clear the air. Check out our history. Go and Google who we are. Go and Google our lines to see if this is really what the situation is. We have nothing to hide here. And to the disingenuous comments that are coming out of Brown University that the Poconoke tribe is not willing to share these lands with the other tribes, we requested on several occasions for the other tribes to come and meet and show their claim to this land. Show a superior claim to Potumtuk than the Poconoke. You don't have it. And the notion that you all can have reservations and then tell another tribe that they have to give you access to their lands, it's just not how Indians treat each other. It's not how tribes deal with each other. It's just not respectful and it's not traditional. So don't take our word for it. Go and look up our history. Our history speaks for itself. Our bloodlines speak for themselves. We don't have any reason to lie. What, what, I mean, what type of individuals would we be to keep up a lie this big for this long? I, I mean, come on. So that's all I'll say about it. PoeMedicomCamp.org. I don't know if the other chiefs have anything else they'd like to add. We're here and we're standing firm. The history speaks for itself. They told his story. We're telling ours. That's the bottom line. The, uh, the history that's out there, they lied about it. And that was probably one of the worst things they could have done to a people, is lie about the history to cover their own mistruths and information. So we will stand with anyone who comes forth and provides uh, support for us in, in our uh, quest for the uh, repatriation of these lands. We welcome their support. And uh, you look at the history and you will see that we were there pre-colonial, and we still, we still are here today. I'll just say one last statement about Hemat Sheila. 
He's a fraud. That's it. Thank you very much, Poe Metal Camp Chronicles, episode one. Look for the next episode airing very soon. We're going to be dropping weekly. Have a great day. PoeMetacompCamp.org. Oh, no, Josh.